carefully, and we had different groups come in, uh, different manufacturers and what have you come in to make presentations to us. And uh, we said we're going out and visiting uh, manufacturing centers and visiting power plants to see the storage capabilities and what was going on in, in the United States. And then uh, after convincing ourselves that it was uh, an extremely safe project, we then subsequently put out an RFP and Holtec uh, was the clear winner of that. They were, they're just a superb company. They have the very best storage system in the world. It's subservice and it's uh, just a, a fortress, if you will, against any kind of
is that it is the government's responsibility. The Department of Energy, by law, under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, is responsible for spent nuclear fuel storage. When the United States stopped reprocessing fuel in 1976 under President Carter, the, the, um, the nuclear utilities had no other recourse for their spent nuclear fuel than to store it on site. Obviously, or maybe not so obviously, there's only so much room in the spent fuel pools that they're currently storing the nuclear fuel in, so we had to go to what's called dry spent fuel storage where we take the spent fuel out. But the Department of Energy has been looking at a, at a site called Yucca Mountain in, in Nevada. And through science, it was determined that was the right place. Through politics, it was determined it was not going to happen. So we are now, the, the utilities are storing the spent nuclear fuel, and they are now suing the Department of Energy because the Department of Energy has failed to fulfill their obligation to take this spent fuel and ship it to some place like Yucca Mountain. And that money is actually coming from a judgment fund, which is our taxes. So in, in fact, right now, we're, we, you, me, everyone, we're paying to, spend, to store the spent nuclear fuel at all of these locations. And this slide has some of the dollar amounts and so on, and it's in your handouts, so I won't go, go through the, de the dollar amounts. This map shows you where the spent nuclear fuel is stored throughout the, the country. There's around 73 sites that currently have spent nuclear fuel. 60 of those sites use the technology that my company has designed and supplied over the last uh, number of decades. So what is spent nuclear fuel? My handy dandy. <laughs> so, this is a simulated fuel pellet. So there's this misnomer that fuel, that spent nuclear fuel, is fuel like you would put into your car. It's not. Nuclear fuel is a solid ceramic pellet. It starts out that way, and it finishes its life that way. So, this spent nuclear, this, it's, it's a simulated one, this is not real. This is a fuel pellet, you can see it. It's about the size of a pencil eraser or maybe the tip of your thumb. What the industry does, we take these pellets and we stack them inside a, stain, a, a steel rod. And we make that into a fuel rod. And then we take a number of those rods and we put them together and that's called an assembly. So when you hear the, the terminology and you read these reports, spent nuclear fuel assembly or a spent, uh, a spent fuel rod, that's what we're talking about. It's, it's not fuel like you would put into your car. It's not a liquid. It's, it's completely solid. And what, oops, go back. I'm going to pass this around so you can see. And on there it also tells you the amount of energy that is produced by a fuel pellet compared to oil and solar and so on. But if you see in this photo, spent fuel is stored at a nuclear plant, inside the plant in a spent fuel pool. It's truly just a big swimming pool. It's about 40 feet deep. And this is the assembly going, actually these are racks. So that assembly, I, I can't tell whether it's going into the rack or out of the rack. But that is a fuel assembly. So again, what we're talking about is solid material that we're, we're going to, to store, and we are storing it now. Okay, now we're done. Okay, so now who is Holtec? My company, Holtec International, was started in 1986. We're a privately held American company, and at our core, we're a technology company. We have a number of PhDs, master's degrees like myself, and we have the in-house capability to take a concept, design it, perform all the analyses on it, manufacture, we also have the ability to do construction, 
We, we have licenses with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for our, for our uh, equipment. We have th currently have 13 licenses with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC. And um, I want to talk about our fabrication. Again, we're an American company, so our, our motto is we're American made. We have three very large manufacturing facilities, one in Pittsburgh, one in Southern Ohio, and then our newest one is in Camden, New Jersey. And, and I, I don't know that John talked as much, this, this introduction as he did the last introduction about the commitment to the communities. Um, similar to the Eddie Lee Energy Alliance commitment to Alia, uh, to Eddie and Lee counties and Carl's Bad and Hobbs, our Holtec is a New Jersey company. We're very committed to the state of New Jersey as well. And, and we're so much so that, that we've invested $360 million in building a state-of-the-art technology campus, which you can see here. This is our, our factory in Camden, our third factory. That factory, the footprint of that is the same size as the, um, the uh, stadium where the Eagles play, the Super Bowl Eagles. So you can get a feel for how large that is. And that's our second largest factory. The one in Pittsburgh is even larger. So we're committed to the nuclear industry. This is what we do, the safe, secure storage of spent nuclear fuel. There are 105 nuclear plants worldwide that use our dry storage equipment. Now keep in mind there's only 440 nuclear plants in the world, so one fourth of those use equipment that's safely stored in our equipment. And we have, um, 12, over 1,200 of our systems are currently loaded around the world. So the basic tenets of consolidated interim storage are shown on this slide. The safety is always number one. The safety of people who are in contact with our dry storage equipment, the safety of the people transporting spent nuclear fuel, loading our equipment, safety is the the preeminent tenant of our company in general. The next is obviously security. The security of the spent fuel stored in the site is also of highest importance to us. And we'll talk more about the safety and security offered by the technology of our project. But also, I want to assure you that the spent nuclear fuel that we'll store here is stored in a, a completely retrievable configuration. The spent fuel will come in, in stainless steel canisters that are seal welded. Those canisters come in on a train, they go into the facility, and those same canisters will eventually go out of the facility. They're retrievable. This is not a permanent disposal site. This is a retrievable, temporary storage facility. So the, the last one that we, bullet we have up there is called temporary. Now temporary in most of our minds is temporary can be, you know, we're, we're here temporarily for the next hour together. In, in this case, truly temporary is measured in decades because the Department of Energy has still not fulfilled their obligation. And until they do and build Yucca Mountain, which we all need to put pressure on, all of us, that's my responsibility and all of our responsibilities to make the, the government perform their obligation. But temporary, it is absolutely temporary. It's never intended to be the permanent site. By law, consolidated interim storage cannot be a permanent site. This is the location of the site. It's located halfway between Carlsbad and Hobbs. And if you've ever driven the, on the highway, I always forget the number. The, the, the highway, the number of the highway between Carlsbad and Hobbs. 6218. Thank you. I'm sorry, I got a lot of numbers in my head. Um, it's very close to the access road to WIP. So if you want to orient on, on where this, this site is located, in a very large plot of land. There's 1,000 acres located in this area. And um, John talked already about the 
um, Eddie Lee Energy Alliance and their invitation to Holtec to come and, and, and participate in this project. But there's some very, very specific aspects of the site that make it incredibly attractive and from a technical perspective for holding this site. Low seismic, minimal water, not close to, to populations, things of that nature. And also, the population in this area, you have Urenko and you have WIP. So nuclear uh, is, is truly part of your vernacular on a daily basis, as well as having in the north, Sandia, Los Alamos, Kirtland Air Force Base, and I think John's gonna talk a little bit more about, about those. So, we, we have received tremendous support from the local communities, from these, the counties that are here. We've, we've, this, this highlights, we've received letters from both the counties and the cities. We have a letter of support from the current governor. We also have memorial letters for both the House and the Senate. And most recently, we have received a resolution signed by seven of the 12 members of the uh, New Mexico State Radioactive and Hazardous Waste Committee. And, and we have also um, received levels of support from other cities in, in the, um, the area as well. So the technology, again, like I said, spent nuclear fuel is solid rods, that are stored inside a canister. This canister is loaded at the nuclear power plants and then it's transported to New Mexico by rail. John's gonna talk very, very detailed about the transportation routes. That canister, seal welded, it's designed and built to the highest levels of the ASME code, which is the American Standard Mechanical Engineering Codes. The canister itself sits below grade on top of a three and a half foot concrete reinforced pad in, in a silo that's completely surrounded by concrete. And that pad on the top is also three and a half feet of reinforced concrete. And each one of those silos holds one canister containing spent nuclear fuel. And then that silo has a 35,000 pound concrete and steel lid placed on top of it to protect the canister. Now, there's, each, each silo, as I said, contains one canister. It sits there. It doesn't need electricity. It doesn't need water. Its cooling is all done passively by air that just passes over the outside of that canister through vents in the lid. That's it. It just sits there. So another thing I want to point out, so, so that, uh, that gives you the, the, the safety of, of the system. It's, there's, there's no moving parts, it just sits there. And also, if you notice, the, uh, the rendering shows people standing, standing above the lid. So you can get a feel for the, the low profile of this facility as well. So you can actually stand at one side of the facility and see all the way across the facility. So now let's talk about the security of the facility. From that perspective, because there's no target above ground, there's nothing for a missile to hit. Not a tornado missile, not a man-made missile, or anything of that nature. And certainly not even an aircraft. Because there's nothing to, to um, present a target above ground. So storing the canister completely below grade provides the maximum security of the spent nuclear fuel. This is a rendering of what the facility will look like. The facility we're, we're, we're going, to, we submitted an application to the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the ultimate storage capacity of the facility will be 10,000 canisters. However, we've asked for the first phase to be licensed, which is 500 canisters. And that 
The facility, as I said before, is 1,000 acres, to, and uh, well, the site is 1,000 acres. The facility will take up about half of that. What you see here, this is a concrete barrier, much like you see on the highway, which will prevent any sort of vehicle from uh, approaching the facility. Then the next level is the uh, double fencing, which is eight feet high and has that barbed wire, we called it concertina wire in the military, on top. And then, of course, there are guards and guns. This facility will have closed circuit television, will have um, the uh, intrusion detection systems, it will have um, the very large towers where it, it will actually it'll probably look like a prison if you've been near a prison. But it has the same level of security that nuclear power plants have. Now earlier this morning I asked, who, and no one had unfortunately, but who here has gone into the WIP facility? Like not to it, but actually down into the WIP facility where you've had to get badged and, and go through the security checks. It's, it's a very rigorous process. So that same level of rigor that you would experience at WIP or that you experience at a nuclear plant, um, if you were to go to Fort Knox, Kentucky and, and try to get in next to the United States Gold Reserve, you just can't do it. You cannot just wander up to a facility. So that's the same rigor of security that we will have here in New Mexico. So the licensing process, as I mentioned, we have submitted our application to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in March of 2017. That application is to construct and operate the facility specifically in Southeast New Mexico. The NRC issued an acceptance letter of our application in March of 2018. And what that means is that the NRC has determined that there is sufficient information for them to begin their technical review. We've had some public meetings here in New Mexico and one on the phone from DC. Um, there was a public comment period open until July 30th on the environmental report. The um, NRC has told us by that letter, that's how they communicate, um, that we will receive a request for additional information on our application at the end of this month, so we expect to see that next week. And they, um, at the NRC, during those public meetings um, that were held here in New Mexico, they identified that there will be additional public meetings once the NRC issues the draft environmental impact statement. So there will be other public meetings, as you see here, um, in the summer of 2019. The NRC, in that acceptance letter they issued in March of this year, states that provided, Moltec provides uh, quality responses in a timely manner to their request for additional information, the license could be granted to construct and operate the facility in July of 2020. Um, one thing I did not mention this morning, but I will mention now, is that our Holtex committed to this project, and we've already expended around $10 million on the licensing application, and we anticipate that to follow the license through, all the way through to, to obtaining it, it will cost around 24 to $25 million. But we're committed to, to laying out that sort of money because we believe that this is a, a good, solid project and the right thing to do. Go ahead. So from a construction standpoint, once the NRC grants the license, and provided there's additional funding, the Department of Energy provides the funding um, for the construction of the site, then we would go forward and it would take approximately three years to construct the site, so technically we could be able to accept the first shipment in um, 2023. What I want to point out on this slide is, again, the low profile nature of the dry storage system that we propose to use here in New Mexico. This is one of my co-workers, and this is the facility that's located at a Cal, it's called Callaway Nuclear Plant. It's in Missouri. And you can see how low this profile is of this system. There is actually spent nuclear fuel stored underneath that lid. And you can see how this 
his name's Brian. So Brian is standing here. One, the dose is is negligible where Brian is standing. There is you can't even measure the radiation dose where Brian is standing. Secondly, you would never know that there was spent fuel stored there unless someone told you. And thirdly, from a security's perspective, this is a presents an unobstructed view from one side of the facility all the way across. There is no way that anyone could try to even sneak up on you. One, they couldn't get into the facility, and two, there's no place for anyone to hide. Go ahead. And this is a facility located at the San, An San Onofre Nuclear Plant, Songs. Um, it, it's in Southern California. You can see it's located right there on the beach, on the ocean, in a very high seismic area. This system is the same system that we proposed to build here in, in New Mexico, and it's licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for the environmental phenomena that it's going to see in California. Tsunamis, earthquakes, uh, tornadoes, any sort of missile. But the beauty of it is that the canister is, again, located below ground. And you can see how low these lids are because those are individuals who are working around those lids. So that, I'll turn it over to John. Uh, thanks again, Joy. While she's changing slides, uh, you're probably wondering who in the world is the NRC and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And by virtue of the Atomic Energy Act, uh, they are the only, they are the singular organization that controls nuclear materials in the United States. And they are a group made up of uh, engineers and scientists and very technical people. And that's what they do. And their, their charge is to protect human health and safety. And that is their, that is their total responsibility. And so they are very, very diligent about it. Uh, when a project is being, uh, being built, they are there to make sure the, the concrete meets the specs, the steel makes the, meets the specs, everything about it meets, meets their speculative specs, and then they are there uh, at nuclear power plants. They're there all the time. Uh, this site, they'll probably be in and out uh, inspecting how the process works and how it's being, being, uh, being discharged. So, they are uh, quite a rigorous and uh, very, very responsible group and been relied on in the United States very, very heavily. So, next slide, please. So, let, what I'd like to do is kind of go over a little bit of the transportation aspects of the project and then talk about some of the benefits to our area. And then we'd like to uh, maybe give you some final thoughts and then hopefully uh, try to answer any questions you have. If we don't have the answers, we'll find them out and get back to you. But, but uh, first of all, I want to show you maps of the transportation system. And I'm showing you this one in particular to show you where WCS is, Waste Control Specialists. I don't know if you know who they are, but they are uh, 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 a storage facility as well as a repository uh, just across the border in Texas. And they too are applying for an application for an interim storage facility. They were on hold for about a year and now they have reinitiated their application. The company, I don't know what happened, they uh, uh, ran out of money or whatever they did. They've now been bought by another company. And so, but at any rate, I want to show you that the route is up through Jow and uh, uh, up through and, and finally gets to, to Eunice. And uh, that's where the, the rail track then would go across into Texas. But most of the rail system, as you can see, is, is all in New Mexico. The other, the other rail system that would be used for our site uh, would come from where the east or the west, but it basically begins in Clovis and then works its way down to the north part of Carlsbad and those, then goes across out into what we commonly call the potash area where there is a tremendous amount of rail. At one point, we were the largest tonnage carrier for Santa Fe Railroad out of, that, out of the potash area. 
So anyway, that's that's the route. And I wanted to show you the two two options, and then this may be a little clearer from where you are, but it shows the route, uh, the blue route down uh, from Clovis, and then this is an I-10 route. This is an I-40 route from both sides of, of the state. So next slide, slide, please. So again, to go over what Joy just mentioned about the, the pellets. Uh, there are really four layers of, of protection in, in the way this system is developed and the way NRC things has to be developed to protect public health and safety. So it starts off with the pellet, which uh, she's passed around. It's exactly what they look like. And then it would go, those get stacked into a zirconium metal fuel rod those are, they're not much larger than the pellet itself. And then they get accumulated into, get placed into a fuel assembly, which is made up of a number of the, the fuel rods. And then from there, they go into, so those are the first, these are the first two containments, the pellet, which is hard ceramic, and then it goes into the fuel rod. Then the third containment, is going into the canister. If you can see the corrugated or honeycomb shape inside of there, each one of these fuel assemblies would slip into one of those, those cavities within the canister. And then the canister is, is welded shut, welded shut permanently, and then uh, this is, most of this is done underwater uh, to prevent the radiation of the, of the people that are working on it. And then the, the water is vacuumed out of the canister and it's replaced with helium, which as you know is an inert gas. That, and so it prevents oxidation from going on inside of the canister once it's sealed. So uh, worries about oxidation are, are limited. And then the, high, the helium also provides a heat transfer medium to transfer the heat from the fuel rods to the outside of the container and then through uh, uh, convection it, it actually removes the heat to the atmosphere. Then if it's going to be transported, it will go into a transport cask like this, which is a very, very robust putt cask. The yellow portion is 15 inches of steel and lead to prevent any penetration. And then after being transported, you saw uh, Joy did a great explanation of the storage facility. Then they get placed into the into silos. So that's that's how the overall. So you've got the, the pellet, which is the first barrier, the fuel rod. You've got the canister, and then you're either in the cask or you're in the storage facility. So four layers of protection, if you will. So next slide, please. So this again is the transportation cast, uh, a better view of it, I think. And so I mentioned the 15 inches of steel and lead. And then on the end, there are what are called impact limiters. So if for some reason uh, the, the cast comes off the rail car, it hits on the impact limiters which absorb the forces. And what the NRC does to, uh, to test these, these, these casts is that they simulate what they consider to be worst case scenario in an accident. And so the, the first thing they do is drop the cast uh, onto its, its most vulnerable point, which is the corner, onto an unyielding surface, which repl replicates running into a bridge embutment or some other uh, non-yielding surface that it would, it would hit. And then after that, they drop it on a spike, which is like what might happen if, if there's a, some sort of metal or rail or whatever that's sticking up and it might happen to hit. So they, they drop it on a spike in the, in the center part, in the, the most vulnerable part. They drop it on it, and then they assume that there's gonna be a rail car next to it that has diesel fuel in it, so, or, or jet fuel, so they burn it, in, in, they burn the cask in, in jet fuel at 1500 degrees, 
for 30 minutes. That's the period of time that they believe it would take for emergency response team to arrive, which is typically what, what happens. And then after that, emergency response team would spray it with water. So to understand that it can withstand the differences in temperature, uh, they then submerge it in 30 feet of water. And it cannot leak. It cannot leak after going through that testing. And they also uh, do a whole lot of modeling. There are a lot of physics models that they, they run this through, dropping it off of trestles and doing a whole variety of things that I have seen in some of the modeling that they put forth to reassure themselves that there's going to be no penetration of the, of the cast. So next slide, please. So this, this is the ra a rail car and how it would be designed. And so this one has 12 axles on it. And then you can see the cast that's being, uh, being carried on top of the rail car. And the reason for the numbers of axles is when these things are loaded, they weigh almost as much as a locomotive weighs. And so people say frequently, well, it, uh, none of our track will, will tolerate these kind of weights, but it's just not true. We see uh, locomotives in the, on the rail that's going to from close to Carlsbad, locomotives are going up and down that all day long. So it, it rep they represent typically the weight of a loaded rail car and they use the numbers of axles to distribute the weight so that the rail tolerates the, the weight of the rail car when it's loaded. So typically also what will happen is the rail cars will be in a unit, in a, either a, what we call a dedicated train or in a unit train and there will be seven to ten of these cars in a row and then there will be a, a buffer car between the front and the end of one of the loaded cars uh, to buffer the engine and at the front and then at the back there will be uh, a, a car with a security car with guards and guns and these things will be satellite tracked next slide i think i've gone over most of the next slide so anyway the the rail routes are the uh, well you, the other thing you may not know is that Almost all of the rail in the United States is private. So something between 92 and 95 percent of the rail is private. It's owned by the different rail companies and uh, they own the track, they own the right-of-ways, and all of those are, are theirs. And they are also responsible for the rail, the, qual the quality for maintaining all of those sorts of things are what they're responsible for. So before they, one of these dedicated trains will ever leave the station from its or original site, it will be inspected thoroughly by the Department of Transportation and the Federal Rail Administration will be involved in, in inspecting it, making sure that radiation levels, all of those things meet, meet NRC standards before it ever leaves the station. And as I said, the, the rail car, the, the cask itself is licensed by the NRC in, independently of any of the other part of the rail system. So they will choose the very best rail, DOT and uh, FRA, the Federal Rail Administration, Department of Transportation, will choose the rail that it will travel down and they'll pick the safest, most secure, the best rail that it can go on getting to the site. And so uh, the, the other thing that they do is that they, in order to control the forces that might occur if some reason the cast gets thrown off the rail car, is that they regulate the speed of the train. So the, the, even on track where trains are going 75 miles an hour, for this shipment, these type shipments, they will only be able to go 50 miles an hour on the very best rail. And when it gets on the rail between Clovis and Carlsbad, as an example, probably it will be reduced down to 20 or 25 miles an hour because it's a lower quality rail. And then when it gets out into the, the, the area east of Carlsbad, into the Potash area, and on its final trip to the site, it will probably be decreased to somewhere in the 10 to 15 mile an hour range. 
And so that's how they control the forces of any impact is by lowering, lowering the speed as well as having the robust container that they have. And again, the weight is distributed by adding more axles and uh, the, the engines themselves, the locomotive motors weigh about the same as a rail car. So it's not unusual, an unusual weight to see on, on rail. Next slide, please. So the, just to give you a little bit of history that's gone on, uh, we know there have been greater than 1,300 used fuel shipments in the United States and without incident. We also know that the Navy has shipped more than 850 shipments and most of those are to Idaho. And so there have been no incidents associated with them as well. And there are just a huge number of nuclear shipments that go on in the United States that none of us ever really know much about because they don't want terrorists to know about when they, where they are and, and when they're being shipped. But warheads, as an example, come into Kirtland Air Force Base and they're shipped to Pantex and Amarillo where they are refurbished there and then they're sent back. And then from Kirtland, they're distributed around the world to various places where they're being exchanged so that they're all viable. Uh, there have been numerous shipments uh, going to Los Alamos, going to Sandia, uh, that, uh, that have occurred all without incident. So I just want to point that out and with just to give you something close by, there have been over 12,000 shipments now to WIP. That have, these are loaded shipments and that's over 14 million miles and that's on the highway, not on the rail where Highway is much more risky than it is on rail. And that's like going to the moon and back 28 times. And so Sandia in our, in our state here does most of the cast integrity testing. They have just completed a 14,000 uh, 14, mile trip from Spain to Colorado where the Department of Transportation has its uh, research center and then shipped it back to, to uh, Spain, uh, so it's gone by truck, it's gone by waterway, it's gone, gone across the ocean, it's gone 2,000 miles from Maryland to Colorado by rail, and all of that without incident, and uh, the, the information that I'm receiving is that the simulated fuel on the, on the shipments uh, has not experienced anything negative, period. So uh, then, uh, cast, in, in my humble opinion, are really virtually indestructible and designed that way. Next slide. So just quickly, just to show you how the site will be built, there's an excavation down to 25 or 30 feet. Next slide. And then they will put these, these silos will be lined up on that concrete slab at the bottom, which is three foot thick reinforced, con reinforced concrete they will be lined up in the next slide. Then you, you can see that then it's filled up with concrete between every one of those silos. So concrete is flowed between them up onto the, the freeboard and, it's, and uh, it's, it's filled in up to three feet below the surface of the top there. And, and so you can see then the final, uh, the final construction is putting in this three foot reinforced concrete on, on slab, which this whole facility, uh, you can think of the, I think the worst weather condition you could ever think about, whether it's a tornado or whether it's a flood or uh, some sort of seismic event, and this is not going to be impacted by any of that. It's designed that way to, to deal with all of those forces and all of those events. It's resistant to an airplane crash that would crash onto the site. It's resistant to missiles. And in fact, uh, Holtec, one of their, uh, one of the countries that they're dealing with in Europe, required their CAF, the, the TAP transportation CAF, to actually be fired into with a missile. And I think you can see that on YouTube if you want to. It moved the CAF, but the, the missile just disintegrates. So that's how robust it is. Next slide, please. So what, what are the benefits to us from, from this project? And so 
we're expecting that there will be incentive payments that will come based on the gross revenue that uh, whole tech receives for the project and we will get a percentage of that depending on what the competition looks like but our target for that is around 30 percent and uh, who knows what will uh, there there may be several others of these facilities that we're old tech's going to have to compete with but at any rate that's our target and we'd like to keep at least 25 percent of that locally and maybe more and then certain amount of that be given to the state for their transportation system roads to be built in southeastern New Mexico. Lord knows we need them, right? <laughs> and so that's what we're we're hoping to do with that. This will be a 2.4 billion capital investment. Ladies and gentlemen, that is that is huge. Uh, the new Facebook investment and in, and in, uh, I guess it's right outside of Berlin is going to be about 1.4 billion and I think that's one of the largest capital investments made in the state and this will be 2.4. We think that there will be about 215 highly paid jobs, maybe more uh, even in the beginning, but there will be 100 construction jobs that will go on for 10 years. As Joy mentioned, they're going to do these in 500 silo increments as demand uh, 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 requires and then there'll be around 100 technical people on site that will be op operational folks that will be permanent uh, it will also be a training center worldwide for this type of facility for people to come in and, and it'll be an educational location for them to come in and be trained and uh, there will probably will also since this will be the summit single point destination it will also be the place where the rail cars and the rail cat, the casts, are are looked at, and maintained. So that will be another uh, another area of expertise. And then, of course, there will be uh, the silos are, are huge. So it makes sense to build them here, as well as the sleeve that goes inside of them. So hopefully, both well, both of those will probably be manufactured in the area. And we're also expecting that there will be a number of spin-offs that will occur in the research area. Uh, aging is a big question. Uh, these things are right now NRC licenses in 40 years, but will go out to 100 years, uh, depending on the aging that goes on. And then uh, we're expecting more science to, be, to occur. Uh, heat transfer applications. Uh, we don't think of it often, but heat is a heck of a resource and being figuring out how to use that productively. We have a lot of produced water in our part of the world and nobody knows what to do with it. We're pumping it back into the ground or we're letting it evaporate on the surface and we're doing something with it uh, that's really non-productive. And we think that with this heat source, uh, conceivably we can get into actually boiling some of that uh, that produce water and creating pure water and distilled water as a result of that. So those are some of the things that we're, we think about and you all yourselves may have other ideas about how, how this facility can be used to our advantage in this part of the world. So uh, just some final thoughts. Uh, there's going to be a consolidated air storage facility, I'm going to assure you. It's either going to be at this site, which is ge uh, geologically and in every way is, is better than any site we know of. Uh, it's very, very stable, and there's no, no involvement with, with water, and uh, it, there's no involvement with the oil and gas industry, and with, with directional drilling now. But, and in the area we're in, it's called the, the, strategic, the Secretary of Strategic Potash Zone, and now because of directional drilling, they can now drill vertically and go underneath the site. They can go wherever with directional drilling. And because of that 2,000 foot layer of salt we have, there's no, no uh, geologic impact on the surface whatsoever. So, uh, but there's gonna be one somewhere. So if, if it's gonna be in, in, in Texas, just across the border from Eunice, it's two miles away from Eunice. And it's, you know, 
15 to 18 miles from Hobbs, 15 to 18 miles from Jow. And so the responsible parties are going to be us. We're the ones in New Mexico that are going to have to respond to anything that may happen with the rail system coming up or whatever may happen. And in fact, I think that their uh, units is already in, and Lee County is already responding to accidents that occur, people get injured or whatever, they're responding to that now. And you're paying for it. So New Mexico, if, if, if it goes to, to Texas, is going to have all the responsibility with zero benefits coming to New Mexico. So I think there's a really strong argument for us to think about the benefits of using our site versus that site and what it means to New Mexico in terms of economic benefit. So uh, we've had WIC and Urenco have been great projects in our area. Uh, they both helped alleviate the ups and downs of the extractive industry. And we all know it's great when it's great, but when it's bad, it's horrid. So uh, that's, that's kind of how that goes. And they can help offset some of, the, some of the economic losses that occurred during those periods. And you know, folks, th this is kind of a niche that we found in Southeast New Mexico with Urenco and with, with WIP. These have both been great projects for our areas. And this is another one of those, that, in fact, probably many, many times safer than because there's nothing mechanical about this. It just sits there. And so it's much safer from that perspective. And it's a really good business. And, uh, you know, we're, we're having other people from around the state and from Texas and other places coming into our communities and telling us what they want and what they don't want. Folks, this is about us and about us understanding the safety and, and the benefit of this to our area and not what people in Fort Worth or San Antonio or Gallup or Santa Fe think about what we're doing in our part of the world. So I think it's that we stand up for our own economic development efforts. And there's, as I said, there's no interaction with the oil and gas industry. And this is about as benign a project, an industrial project, as you ever could think of. It just sits there and convection and cooling goes on and that's all that, all that happens there. So there's no pumps, no moving parts. It's just a, a very, very safe project. So with that, uh, thank you for listening to us, and we'd be happy to try to answer any of your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. So, how long does it take for the nuclear spent rods to become inert, no, no longer radioactive? The, the the significant part of the fuel rod is the what are, what are called the fission materials, uh -huh. and they're the ones that create the heat, okay. and they're the ones that create um, the the high levels so of radiation. And, and so those those have a basically have an average 30 year half life. So if you think about it being 100 percent when it arrives, which it won't be, they probably have already gone through one decay cycle. But if it's 100 percent, then in 30 years it's down. It's 50 percent. In another 30 years, it's 25 percent. By 100 years, it's down to 12 and a half percent. And then over the next 50 to 100 years, it gets down to practically zero. And the only thing that's really left that, that's long life is the plutonium part of it. And the plutonium that's in there, as you may or may not know, I think we all talk, think about plutonium as being this bomb stuff, and, and it's uh, you know, very, very dangerous and all that. Well, granted, if it's in the right shape and in the right density, and a variety of things that can be very, very dangerous from that point of view. But it is basically only an alpha emitter. And an alpha particle only goes about six feet at the most, and it's stopped by skin, stopped by paper, your clothing. So it's not a very energetic particle. So in reality, you could probably put the plutonium in a cardboard box and contain it, even though we, we want to keep it uh, isolated from the biosphere for long periods of time because it has a very long half-life. But it is probably the least dangerous and that's what you end up with at the end of the day. You end up with some plutonium and a little bit of neptunium which fall 
in the same category. So it's, I, I know it's hard to think about it differently than something that's really, really dangerous because it makes bombs, but the reality is it's probably the easiest of the isotopes to contain because it's so low energetic in the form that it's in. Yes, I think my first concern is the use of the word temporary because while yes, it is based on your interpretation of what that means, technically the way they get, they get rid of waste material is actually by permanently burying it. So if you've already seen that this has been an issue in the past where the um, what organization did you say? The Department of Energy has not handled it accurately, but it's not to say that that's going to happen here. And then furthermore, you're talking about putting it underground, which we all know is fresh water for us, and that is a huge issue that I think all the Mexicans can get behind is our fresh water, uh, specifically our groundwater. Um, and to add to that, what about environmental racism? I mean, we always talk about money and how, you know, yeah, New Mexico needs more money, but at what expense? Yes, economic development is great for our state, but health-wise, what can you really say? There's a reason why you have to go to so many safety precautions to do that in order for it to be considered safe. And if it is safe, then why does it matter if we have a less populated state versus an area that has higher population? I'll let you take the last two. I'll take the first okay. one. Okay. So, the, first of all, the, there, there is spent nuclear fuel already out there, and it is stored safely. And the reason that we do it safely it's just what you said. It's out there. We have an obligation to store spent fuel safely, and that's that's what my company does. And um, so you asked about the Department of Energy. There's 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 a, the nuclear the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 is what stipulates that it's the federal government's responsibility to take title to and and ultimately dispose of the spent nuclear fuel. I challenge you. You're really young. Get on a get on a, a, a kick for the government to reprocess this spent nuclear fuel like we used to do. That's the right answer, quite frankly, mm -hmm. if we're going to be honest with each other. So then we don't have to dispose of as much. I, that is that's joy talking to you guys, but I think that's what we ultimately should do. Even if we were to start doing reprocessing, we still need to have an interim storage site. Because there's there's those sites out there that I mean the, the reality is storing this next to New York City versus storing it someplace if you've been out there there's there's no one that lives out there. But that's so what I'm saying so though it is environmental racism. Then. Why because, do you say that? Because then why did so we don't matter as much because we're less populated? That's not what we're saying. So then why does it matter if it's in New York City or if it's in Lee County? It's a matter of being safer. So we're putting it in an area that's safer. You don't have the you don't have the population and therefore that's if you look at terrorist attacks, terrorist attack soft targets. Have you ever had a terrorist attack here? No. Has there been a terrorist attack in New York City? Yes. But now you're opening us up to that now because now that is located here. It's no longer located in New York City. So if you want to really create mass destruction you, you could technically do it here, and now that, that that facility is going to be stored here. From a technical perspective, I've shown you how this is protection against a terrorist attack. So technically, you cannot have a terrorist attack on this facility. It's not possible. You can't get to the facility. You can't fly. Even if you were to fly a plane into it, the canister stored below ground in a concrete bunker in a retrievable configuration. That's why it's not a permanent waste dump. This is a retrievable configuration that is ultimate protection against terrorist attacks. And it's a hard target. Terrorists don't go after hard targets. There's no, there's no bang for their buck by doing that. So the other one here. You, you asked yeah. one, one thing about water and yeah. protecting your water supply. This is not over the Ogallala. It is about 15 miles west of the Ogallala, and there's no communication route to the Ogallala from, from this site. And the, the Ogallala is basically under the salt 
that, that is there, and uh, there's just no route for it to get there. And uh, a concrete monolith that doesn't interface with water. It's like saying this, this table could contaminate a water supply. I mean, if you, this, it's well. just, I understand. But the concept is that it's a, this is a solid. So again, going back to the concept, people think of spending your fuel. It's unfortunate that the industry chose to use the word fuel because Fuel is what you put in your your car. It's what you put in an aircraft. It's anything that can create energy. Um, I'm sorry. Anything that can create energy. Correct. But I, I'm, people think of fuel as being a liquid, and unfortunately, the industry selected to use the term fuel when they talk about this, the nuclear fuel, and it's it's a solid. So, uh, the, my other question in terms of economic development, you said 215 jobs about. 25 to 50 percent is what you would keep locally, John. Is that correct? We're, we're hoping they're all be locally. Okay, so they should all be locally. If if we were to guesstimate uh, that percentage, you're talking about 53 people of those 215 being hired from a local standpoint. Do you refer to that as state locally or like Lee County local? Like well, what is your? We, we don't know whether they will all live in Lee County or live in Eddy County. It's kind of halfway between, mm -hmm. but. You have a great core facility in the house. <laughs> it may be quite attractive. <laughs> One, well, the reason why I'm asking is because I mean, economic development is huge, I think, for everybody in this area, especially when we have everybody working in the oil field, and we all know it goes up and down. Um, so when we're looking at jobs that are diversified or that actually right. can, you know, help our communities, we're talking about blue collar jobs. So is this? Are these? Well, there, there will be some upper there will be some upper management jobs in, in this arrangement as well. Mm -hmm. We're just talking about average, mm -hmm. and uh, clearly there'll be managers, there'll be true, uh, but electrical technicians, red techs. Uh, most of our work field that actually has a professional like a diploma or anything like that actually leave the state. They don't normally, for the majority, they don't stay here. So a lot of our jobs are really blue collar jobs. What we're looking for, and that really does help sustain our economy here. So that's why I was asking, if, are these jobs, yeah, 100 construction jobs, but 100 construction jobs is 100 construction jobs, all construction is going on. After that, that goes away, and we're still well, trying the, to find alternative jobs. Yeah, the expectation is they'll go on for 10 years. Uh, that, that, so that's, you know, in today's environment where people change jobs every three or four years, that's, I, I think you can call those a permanent job. So it would take 10 years to build a facility? Yeah, it take 10 years to build okay. it out. Okay. So it won't happen overnight. Okay. So it's gonna, there'll be construction jobs going on for probably a minimum of 10 years. And there may be other, you know, as we talked about the water issue, there may be a whole different construction project associated with that. So there may be some other activities we're expecting that there will be some scientists that, that you know, when you get uh, that consolidation, uh, folks will come here and want to study what's what's going on and, and get into all the assurances that we would expect. So we're expecting that that will occur and, and researchers, no doubt, will be here. There are a number of, of organizations throughout the United States that deal with nuclear materials and we're expecting that we would see a whole host of those involved in this and so it's just i think a normal process that would occur once it gets going but they're very good questions very good points I want to just, so you don't think it's going to take us 10 years the first phase with 500 silos is projected to take three years oh and then as we as we increase expand, expand exactly as the demand goes if, if, let's let's say yucca mountain does open and then we just take the inventory from here and ship it to um, to Yucca Mountain. Um, so I didn't want you to think that it's going to take us 10 years. We could the first phase would be three years, and then the intent is that we would construct additional phases as needed, and that could take up to 10 years for those phases. Could you expand on what you were referring to earlier when you talked about the politics in Yucca Mountain and how that stopped basically it being transferred? Can you do like just a little bit of background information? There are all kinds of speculation that. Uh, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act in 1982, uh, 
demanded that there be a repository in the United States being done by the Department of Energy and what, what the, the, how it was going to be financed was that people that were using electricity from a nuclear power plant were going to pay a mill per kilowatt, mill per kilowatt hour into a fund called the Nuclear Waste Fund. And so that, that fund funded the initial part of Yucca Mountain. In 1987, it was more or less designated as the, the final, final site. And then in 2002, I think it was, the president uh, at that point also designated it final site. And then from that point forward, uh, the NRC got involved in what they call the safety analysis. Of the, of the facility, which leads to the draft EIS, and, and so that draft environmental impact statement. And uh, that's more or less been stopped because the funding necessary for the, the NRC to go through the process has not been there. And the state of Nevada has been opposing it in, with a significant amount of vigor. There are eight counties around the project which support it strongly, but you know when you start talking about Clark, Clark County, which is where Las Vegas is, that's where the dominant portion of the population of the state is, and so they're they're having uh, have a lot to say about what's going on, and it's become kind of a political football in Nevada, and and so if you're running for office and you don't oppose Yucca Mountain, you know you're going to have a really hard time getting elected, and so that's what's happening now, and. Folks are trying to figure out how to overcome that. But that's kind of what's going. Uh, Dean Heller is running, rerunning for the Senate. And, uh, you know, the Senate, the House has, has been very responsive to Yucca Mountain. In fact, they've had high majorities, over 300 members out of, out of uh, what, 400, what is it, 355 uh, people in the House. Uh, and the numbers like, 290 to 300 members of the House have voted to support it. But then when it gets to the Senate, the Senate is opposed to it because the Senate majority is so fragile. <laughs> it's, it's right on the edge. As you know, there's only a one member majority in the Senate. So one, one senator makes a huge difference in who's in charge. So that's why it's got to be this big political football, uh, even though the House but you know the House is made up of members predominantly from the two coasts. So you've got you know California, Oregon, Washington, and then you have on the other on the East Coast where the majority of the members are. Those of us in the middle have very little representation in the Senate unless you're from Texas. Otherwise, there aren't very members very members from the center part of the, of the country. Uh, you probably never thought about this, but. If you've been in the political world, that's kind of how it's it's parsed out. And so the, the coasts kind of control the House, and the Senate's every every state has two members, thank God. But at any rate, uh, it gives us all a voice in the Senate. But that's kind of the political landscape, if that helps. And uh, there's uh, something like $37 billion in that waste fund to go forward with Yucca Mountain, the interest on that money is about $1.2 billion a year. And there have been a number of bills introduced in the House to actually use the interest off the fund to pay for interim storage. Uh, so there's a, a great, good deal of interest in interim storage. And if Yucca Mountain comes, uh, comes to pass and they get the funding, it's going to take probably 20 a minimum of 20 years to get all the laterals mined out and all of the effort that has to be done to get it active, maybe 30 years. So interim storage is definitely needed in that period of time. Do, do we have the workforce um, to fill these positions? I mean, in Lee County, I don't know about Eddy County, but in Lee County we've always had an issue with workforce. We don't have the workforce because everyone's in the oil field. Do we have the workforce to uh, fill these positions? And if when uh, Urenco came in, they got together with the New Mexico Junior College and they created a program 
where you're training these younger generation that are getting out of high school, getting out of college to, for this type of trade, is that something that Holtec is looking at doing? Yeah. That, that's exactly what will happen. Yeah. That, that's a great question. It is a good question. I, I don't think this is working anymore. You're, that, that's a great question. That's why I mentioned Camden. So we just built and opened our, our third factory in Camden, New Jersey. And if you're familiar with Camden, it's, it's, it's quite an impoverished area. And, and that's exactly what we did. We, we had a timeline for how long it was going to take us to build the factory. And in that time period, we went to the Camden High School and we established a program first to recruit from, from the Camden High School. And then we also established a program with the Camden County Community College for welding program. So they go directly from the high school into the welding program. And then they, can, they come to us. If they can't pass the welding test right away, we hire them in as a laborer. And we have a welding school. In, so in our, on our campus, we have a 50,000 square foot warehouse building. And in that building, we have a welding school. And it's open from 3 to 6 every day. And you go out there and you can practice your welding. It's all welding simulators. And when you're comfortable, then you retest. And you are allowed to continue to do that and stay as a laborer until you pass that test. Or you, you, you can just stay a laborer, too. But welders earn more money than a laborer does. Right. And it's, it's a more prestigious job. And so we are, we absolutely fully are committed to doing that same sort of process here. And we'll have time. Once that application, what we submitted the application, once it's approved and once we uh, identify funding to construct, we'll have a three-year window where we'll be able to, to get that program together and start start working um, on on getting the right people hired. So, in University of New Mexico has an excellent nuclear engineering program too. Yes. So, also, your site is it located in Eddy or is it located in Lake? It's in Lake County. Okay. How much? Uh, Revenue will it generate for the county? We, I don't know. I haven't. I couldn't tell you because I haven't put the numbers to it. Uh, just to be frank about it, we have an agreement in the Eddingley Alliance and between the four partners that whatever money will be split between the partners, but it will be, you know, two point four billion dollars will generate a lot of advertising taxes. <laughs> but it, uh, what kind of uh, spinoff companies were you talking about? Uh, evidently, you've experienced this before, so what what did you see in other sites that these spinoff companies that you said emerged? Right. So first, what, what one of the things John has, the, the silos that we're going to put in the ground are large, and we currently manufacture those either in Pittsburgh or in, um, in Camden, New Jersey, and ship them to either to California, we ship them to Callaway and Missouri. Manufacturing those here would be the right answer. It's for economic development as well as just to not have those being shipped across the country as well. So the first and foremost would be the um, establishment of, of a facility here or facilities because we're going to need 500 of those right off the bat um, before we can even pour the concrete. So we'll, we'll, they're, they're big, large. Um, carbon steel cylinders that have a lot of welding on them as well, so they need to be rolled and welded. So that's one of the first ones. Do you have to have a cold roll production facility like they do in Pittsburgh? Or um, would you just it's, it's only one quarter, it's only one inch carbon, and uh -huh. so if, if there's a rolling, if, if there's a facility around here that can roll, and I think that even a 15 foot wide roller would work. So it doesn't have to be heated? No, no it can be cold roll. Because it's only one inch, it's, it's not that. Okay. Um, it could be heated if, it, if, if the facility didn't have the ability to hold roll one, one inch, but we could do that. Then another thing that we did in Camden was we locally sourced. So while we were constructing, we locally sourced um, as much material as we could. We locally sourced, um, you know, office supplies. Um, Xerox machines. Everything that we needed, we we um, we used about 40 different suppliers within the city of Camden, and um, just established our footprint there as a good neighbor, and and continue to to use those. You didn't order it off Amazon, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
probably ordered some off Amazon, but for the most part, we, we tried to source locally. I know we had several uh, groundbreaking, we had a topping off ceremony and so on, so the, the catering was done locally, making the signage of, of having large posters printed and then built to put up um, for the, the governor came several times to, to observe the progress of the facility. We, we locally sourced all of that. We just it, it's, there's a lot to go around when you're building a, a $360 million facility and $2.4 billion down here. How much, just out of curiosity, how much cubic yards of concrete does it take for 500 canisters? That's a good question. Because I'm sure our concrete companies would really like to know that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, I, I think we're going to do, um, we'll have to have batch plants on site too because I think we, we looked at having two batch plants on site because the raw you manufacture the concrete yourself. We'll, we'll have to buy the all cement, of the aggregate, aggregate, right? The cement, the aggregate will have to be purchased, but the actual mixing would, and we probably have to hire the people to run the batch plants because we don't, we don't run batch plants. We test the concrete. We've hired, you know, QA inspectors to mm -hmm. because that that's nuclear grade concrete. That's not just you know go put me a nice. Well, we we have some of the best concrete people in in the country in this area. Plus a big potash money. Yeah, plus right. a big potash money. <laughs> I do. Yeah. That's, That's intrepid. awesome. Intrepid. <laughs> so we do have a question that has come in. Um, so I'm just going to read it. So uh, since we are Facebook Live and we're, um, we're about to pop out. Um, but the question is from someone is, uh, in the event of an accident during transport, how quickly can the public be evacuated, public concerns? And has this been thought out by emergency management? Okay. Yeah. Holtec has been in and talked with the local emergency management people and gone over emergency management with them, both in Eddie and Lee County, who both uh, direct the emergency management in the area. The other areas of the state will be responding as well as emergency emergency management teams, whether it's in Chavez County or Roosevelt County or Curry County, and also along the routes. And basically, the emergency response teams, they respond to any emergency basically in the same way. And they are ready for all incidences that occur. And if it becomes a radiologic incident, then they wait for the RAD people to get onto the site. Again, there, if, if, I, I can't imagine any nuclear material getting out of the casks. Now, if the, if the outside cask for some reason gets punctured, the only thing coming out of that is not nuclear material. It, it's, those are in the pellets. That's in the pellets, which is, which is enclosed. It, there may be additional radiation, but it will be directionally it will be directional based on where the where the impact is on the cask. And so the cask is not going to disintegrate. So you may have radiation leakage out of the cask, but that will be managed by the emergency response people who will use lead shielding or other kinds of approaches to ameliorate it. Just like going to the dentist when they put the uh, the lead shield over your chest. Uh, there'll be those kind of approaches that get used. Uh, we're just going to wrap it up on uh, Facebook. So it is available um, if anyone wants to pass it on. It will be posted on our um, Facebook page. So we want to thank you, Joy and Jan, for coming and presenting the information out to the uh, And of course, we invite you again, um, to get more information out to anyone that needs it. As this thing advances, we would like very much to come back again and tell you how what the progress is and what's actually happening. Uh, you, you deserve to know and we want you to know. And thank you for taking the time to come. We really do appreciate that. I know it's, you have busy, busy days yourselves and we really appreciate you coming. And uh, if there are any questions that you have after you leave, please feel free to, I think Joy left her card with you. Uh, you can call call her, you can call 
uh, Lee County here, and they can give you my, my number, and uh, we'd be happy to try to answer any questions that you, you have as, as you begin to think about it a little more. So again, thank you so much for, for taking the time to come. We really do appreciate it.